Any church that, as we do, purports to be Christian has a high view of Jesus, which we do. But it is not the kind of high view of Jesus that is held by many traditional American Christians. Because we don't tell the story of Jesus the way that many traditional American Christians do. Now, there's good reason for that. The story many American Christians tell comes from a very narrowed part of our tradition, and it ignores a vast swath of uh, our tradition. Many parts of Christianity that were not shaped by Western Christianity's fourth century join up with the Roman Empire, they tell the story of Jesus very differently. Christianity outside of Rome's influence was much, much less shaped by the sensibilities of empire, the Roman Empire. They were much less interested in making sure everybody stayed in lockstep, that everybody was saying the same things, believing the right doctrines. Now, there's a term that theologians use to talk about the doctrinal story we tell about Jesus. The term is Christology. Our kids do not need to know that. <laughs> you don't need to know that. <clears throat> but it's a term that's influenced by a religion that is built on believing the right stuff. A religion that makes sure that everybody believes all the right things about God, Jesus. In this case, Jesus. That's what Christology is. It's a term that makes Jesus important to Christians in a doctrinal belief kind of way. And in many parts of Christianity, Jesus is doctrinal kind of important. But as our community, we have found more life and more growth talking about the importance of Jesus, the way that those not influenced by Rome parts of Christianity have talked about Jesus. So to help us understand the difference so that we can talk to our kids, <clears throat> we have to understand the difference between two words that often get conflated. And the two words are divinity and deity. Divinity and deity. There's a lot of Christian history in the book, especially how Jesus underwent a fundamental shift once Rome took over. So I'm not going to rehearse all that. It's in the book. But let me tell you about one important day in our tradition, June 19th, 325. That was the day that the final document was published that summarized a month of work by a bunch of bishops who gathered in the city of Nicaea that's in what's now modern-day Turkey. 325 was smack in the middle of those years when Christianity was becoming the official religion of Rome. And that was creating no small pressure on Christianity, on Christianity to modify the story that we tell about Jesus. The pressure was there to talk less about how Jesus carried the divine in a special way. That had been the Jewish way of thinking. And to talk more about Jesus being a deity, a kind of God or demigod. The Romans were very comfortable with that. It fit quite nicely in their worldview. So a month of back and forth among the bishops. No, it's this way. No, it's that way. No, it's like this. No, it's like that. And here's what they came up with. It became known as the Nicene Creed. And the Nicene Creed has been Christian orthodoxy ever since. But be warned, what they said about Jesus, very dissatisfying. Huh. Way too vague, way too fuzzy, and honestly, just hard to understand. Here's what they said. Jesus is fully human. Jesus is fully divine. That's it. That's been orthodoxy. Jesus is fully human. Jesus is fully divine. So <clears throat> what does that matter to us, and how does it impact how we talk to our kids about Jesus? Well, here's how. Those words have remained central in our tradition because their vague fuzziness captured something really important. Those Nicene bishops, in the end, they resisted the Roman pressure. They resisted the impulse to make Jesus fit into the easy thinking that matched how Rome was thinking. They resisted the impulse to turn Jesus into a god or a demigod, a deity. Instead, fully human, fully divine. Which honestly, what does that even mean? <laughs> it says, in is out and up is down and light is dark. What is wrong with you bishops? 
you know we live in an either or world. You're either in or out. You're either up or down. You're either human or God. And what, you enshrine for all of history, fuzzy paradox, that's what you go with? And yeah, that's what they went with. They resisted the Roman pressure. They resisted the embedded archetypes in all religions. Every ancient culture worshiped deities of some kind, sun gods or ocean gods or river gods. Every ancient religion had some superhuman, immortal god, and they did not go there. Now, to be fair, Rome probably won in the end. Because even though most churches in the West for centuries and centuries read the Nicene Creed out loud every Sunday, nevertheless, in our functional thinking, not the words we said out loud, but in our functional thinking, Jesus became more deity than divine, more God than human. One church that I grew up in, there was a weekly aphorism that was spoken every Sunday. When we said it, we were establishing our Christian credentials in our minds. The people would all say out loud, and Jesus is God. So in, in the end, in many ways, Rome won. We did turn Jesus into a figurehead. We turned Jesus into a symbol, a deity. And we've suffered the consequences of doing it. We lost some of the beauty and some of the magic that was embedded in our tradition. Years ago, there was a campaign among young church kids. <clears throat> they all got rubber bracelets with the letters WWJD, which said, what would Jesus do? I think it was an attempt to remind kids to do the right thing. But when our unspoken assumption about Jesus runs to deity, it becomes kind of a pointless question. Well, here's what Jesus would do. Jesus would be God. Jesus would be sinless. Jesus would be perfect. Jesus would be in a completely different category from me. That's what Jesus would do. So what's the point of the question? We lost some of that beautiful, important magic in our tradition when we settled for a Roman deity. Because reduced Jesus to a deity, we put him into a separate, not like me, category and lost access to the magical parts of his very human life. Reduce Jesus to a deity and very quickly our deity becomes the one true deity and yours not. And when that happens, well, we better have a crusade. We better go kill all the Muslim infidels. We better have a pogrom. We better kill all the Jewish infidels. We better have an inquisition and kill all the Christian infidels. And we better go colonize the southern world. Sure, we'll take all their stuff and we'll exploit their labor, but it'll still be a good deal for them because they'll get the one and true deity. Reduce Jesus to a, to a deity? All kinds of problems. It's also a problem in that it cuts out the essence of our tradition's brilliance. <clears throat> what those bishops were trying to do when they went all fuzzy they were challenging very commonly held but shallow and very limited instincts about what humanity is and what divinity is. Here's what Jesus showed us they were insisting. Jesus showed us what it means to be fully human. That to be fully human is to be fully divine. To be human is to be divine. So, while the Nicene Creed, while we don't read it in our community every week, it is how we want to talk to our kids about Jesus. The word deity <clears throat> is a noun. It's a thing, a God. The word divine is an adjective. It's a description. A divine person lives in a way that shines the light of God. Those are two very different stories, deity and divinity. When Jesus is a deity, a god or a demigod, our focus is, our energies are to revere the superhuman figure at the center of our faith. We worship and adore a deity from a distance. We make offerings to, we make vows to, we offer daily prayers to, we organize our worship around affirming and honoring our deity, pleasing our God. Now, like me, you might have been 
part of religion, participated in religious services that were like that. And they honestly could feel very good. But on the other hand, <clears throat> if the central figure of our religion modeled for us what humanity truly is and told us and prayed for us that we, carrying the same indwelling divine, that we can carry the same character of God that he did, well, that story, while it is more demanding because now we have something to live up to, it's also a story that our teenagers can ask, well, what would Jesus do? That story tells us that we are able to, in fact, are designed to live life the way Jesus lived life, in a divine manner. And that story, that religion, that spiritual journey becomes an exercise in waking up to the divine capacity that we carry within us, waking up to the deep reality that we carry within us, the one that we might not have even recognize. So how do we talk to our children about Jesus? We talk to them about Jesus the way that our tradition has talked to them about Jesus. Jesus demonstrated divinity living in humanity. We venerate Jesus because he showed us that to be fully human is to be fully divine. Now, we don't say that other central figures in other religious traditions, they do not show us divinity. We don't say that we alone have the one true divinity. But we are Christians. Jesus is our central figure. He is the narrative with which we are most familiar. So we tell our kids that Jesus, as Paul said uh, more than once, was the firstborn of a new reality. And we tell them that after the firstborn, there's a secondborn and a thirdborn and a multi-billionth born. And that dear child is you. We tell them ours is an awakening journey awakening to the divine that is in us, divinity living in our humanity, just like it was living in Jesus' humanity. We tell them that we revere Jesus, we venerate Jesus, not because an external deity came down to earth, but because we saw how each of us, even though we often don't feel like it, each of us carries the same divine within us. We don't venerate Jesus because he was different from humanity. We venerate Jesus because he was really good at humanity. So good that he helped us realize that to be human is to be a carrier of the very spirit of God. So we tell our kids that they carry the divine image. They carry the deep, ineffable, transcendent mystery within, just like Jesus did. Now that's a story that's embedded in our Christian scriptures. It's a story embedded in our Christian history, except the part that lost its way after Rome. It's a story that can inspire our kids to live their best lives. So that's how we want to talk to our kids about Jesus.